Ian Burns and we're here at the University of Technology in Sydney where I have a solo show which we're sitting in which is called Too Much Is Real but also I've been an artist in residence here for the last 11 weeks and doing, in doing that I've been constructing an exhibition which is in the old uh, disused goods line tunnel behind the UTS buildings and that show is called Extended Stage. In the show we're sitting in here in Too Much Is Real there are four works um, that basically, though two of the works are older works, they've been borrowed back, they were made for previous shows, but they, we borrowed them because they fit this premise of Too Much Is Real, um, which is actually a line from a Sex Pistols song which plays a part in this show as well, but it seems appropriate uh, in the context of not just the UTS environment but in today's world. So we have three sculptures and a video. There's a sculpture that generates, it's sort of based on that film script line you see from something like Poltergeist or whatever, Strange Cloud Above it's called. And it's a wheelbarrow standing on a tree stump which has a security camera on it which films into the tray of the wheelbarrow and generates through a little bit of other simple special effects with a salad bowl and other useful items. It generates onto a TV screen a sort of this filmic sequence of the boiling cloud that we all know from various 80s movies particularly. Then we have uh, uh, one of the first pieces I made where I started focusing the filaments of light bulbs onto the walls to generate diagrams and text and ideas. Uh, and so this, this work actually generates a very rough diagram of a ship. It was actually made as a, for an exhibition I was in some years ago at Lake Macquarie City Gallery for where I grew up, which is the area where I grew up. And that show was ostensibly about the lake or the concept of a lake. And the thing about Lake Macquarie is that it has no proud moment of discovery. The ship to discover it ran, ran aground thinking it was somewhere else. So there is no proud rendering ever been made of Martha, the ship captained by Captain Reed that discovered uh, Lake Macquarie. So I felt entitled to make uh, at least Martha's shadow. Uh, the new, two new works in the show, there is a work that's flashing behind me, which is called Blender. Uh, not that the premise is particularly important to the work, but it, it, it generates, it, uh, not being a musician, I was I've always known this fact, and apparently not many people know it, that the Sex Pistols song, uh, Pretty Vacant, is actually, uh, if not based on, at least um, was, uh, what's the word, but uh, stimulated by, suggested by, they, it was a homage to ABBA's SOS. And I always felt like the lyrics belonged with the other melody, but not being able to test that through, by playing an instrument myself, I just decided to build a sculpture to do that for me. Um, so it generates sound through a children's keyboard I've hacked and I've just picked, hacked it so that it'll play the Sex Pistols music with, whilst throwing up the lyrics um, on, by various display mechanisms of ABBA's SOS and then it does the opposite, plays the music for ABBA's SOS whilst throwing up the lyrics on the wall through this bulb projection again of um, the Sex Pistols Pretty Vacant. And finally, um, a sort of a departure from sculpture in this show, there is a video which is called Breath AC. Uh, it's kind of an homage to Michael Snow in a way in the title. But um, it is, I've, I've been doing a lot of shows in Australia over the last four years. And being a sculptor, that means I spend an inordinate amount of time in Bunnings and pay them lots of money. And. Um, I noticed from the very first time I was going into the big Bunningses here that there's always a swinging light. Uh, these pseudo magical moments, you know, you were supposed to observe the world as we go around and of course, you know, there's magic even in Bunnings. And I've been waiting for four years for one that was just perfect to film. They're all kind of cool, but uh, this particular one down in Alexandria, I walked in, the first time I walked in there and there it was, the, the swinging light in the corridor with all these mirrored cabinets at the top and this wonderful you know, zinc loom, bright, shiny steel cabinet down the end, all the labels blowing in the breeze, um, the sound of the air conditioning, the big fan at the top, it just to me was an ideal composition. And, uh, and it really actually fit with this idea of too much is real. It's so beautiful I can't cope. 
So that's the show here. And then down in the goods line tunnel, we have extended stage. Now that show is of a different bent to this. It's basically this rare opportunity for the viewer to go into and experience a, a hidden part of Sydney. Um, this disused tunnel, you know, never open to the public really, maybe every now and then with the private Sydney tours. It's really about looking in and looking out and, and making display and being displayed. So it uses china cabinets, there's eight china cabinets, two vitrines and an old ship's piano and a, a scrap wood parquet floor I built to the elements, fundamental elements. And then the other fundamental, el fundamental element is a series of light sculptures that actually communicate between all these objects and the whole thing is controlled by light rather than running a cable. Even though I use a lot of technology in my work, I'm always looking for a nostalgic retro to combine with the new media sort of elements so that rather than run cables you know, and take the easy way out of communication with this project, it all communicates through light, which is obviously incredibly appropriate in a rail tunnel. So the cabinets, the china cabinets, the eight china cabinets are paired. There's, again, children's keyboards in them. And again, I'm playing around with music algorithms in those. And they're paired with phenomenological events, if you like, a sort of nod to the history of the wonder cabinet. Um, so there's balls juggling on air, there's uh, one becomes a fountain, one fills with fog, and one's been converted into a freezer. And then when you reach as far as we can go into this old tunnel, and there's this beautiful point of an 1855 constructed proper sandstone, cut stone arch, and that's the final point in the tunnel we get to after progressing up. Um, and at that point you walk onto this parquet floor and it triggers the old ship's piano, I've mounted solenoids on it so I can plunk out um, a very out of tune and very, not very w nice piece of music, but sort of the whole nature of the space and the instrument actually sort of make it reference nice without ever quite getting there, which is an important thing. So I think there's kind of two things, and maybe we start with the algorithms because that's the conversation we're having before. But then one which I imagine which you've talked about a lot is that idea of hacking or the idea of, um, so hacking the keyboards, but also, you know... Repurposing. Things, repurposing. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a musician, so uh, the, and yet over the last few years, because a lot of my research previously and a lot of my works have played with the cinematic, like the strange cloud above here. And it's through that sort of work I started trending into uh, making music to go with my work. I just sort of was doing other sound elements. I'd use fans to make, you know, the sound of a windset, windswept plane and things like this. Um, and all these sort of trompe l'oeil video works would have this trompe l'oeil sound. And then I started moving into making, deciding I was going to make music with them. So started getting hold of keyboards and, you know, other sorts of sound making children's things. Um, there's so many sound chips and things these days, it's not hard to find pieces of sound. But I have no musical training other than the sort of music classes we had in high school. I mean, I can sort of figure out how to read music and try and trans transcribe that into code and work it into a hack. But in the end, what m most interests me about the music is not I mean, in, in looking into this structure of music, I'm just fascinated about, at how beautiful and skillful successful pieces of music are um, and obviously in me there's this faint ambition of maybe achieving that somewhere, sometime in one of my algorithms but I'm more interested in randomizing the whole sort of sound output of these things and referencing the structure of what something might be and this relates not just to the sound of the works I make everything I try and do really I'm, try, I'm, not try, I'm trying to make something that hovers a bit, a bit between ridiculous and beautiful not just the music, but the actual structures, what, everything that occurs. And the music's become a powerful tool to do that. Uh, the first piece where I really did it was actually shown at Acme a couple of years ago, and it was this very complicated work that uh, was part of Experimenta. And it, um, it did this sort of road movie sequence of scenes but then I had this children's keyboard I'd hacked and I developed this structure of the, you know, the you know, quiet piano, you know, Michael Nyman-esque sort of 
backdrop, the trope. I mean, everything's tropes these days with technology and the distribution of information systems we're in, everything's down to tropes. So I only have to reference the structure of something to create that evocation. So to me, if I took, if you shut your eyes and you weren't looking at what, what I made or so on, and you just heard the sound, you'd be like, well, that's a pretty naff piece of music. It's actually not very good yet. The feedback I constantly still get from that piece because it's traveling around the country is the music is beautiful. Um, and it, it's not actually, it's, it's structurally and so on, it references the beautiful, but it's not uh, quite. I mean, I wish it was in some ways, that would be an ambition, but, <laughs> but then it would become something else. And uh, if I made the music beautiful, it probably wouldn't be appropriate for my art. It would become something else to be performed some other way. But, so there's a lot of sound in the extended stage product, uh, project, and it really is uh, driven sculpturally the way I work, in that I'll be, it was all found, the foundation piece is this old ship's piano that we got for 20 bucks and paid 270 bucks to have moved. And it had, I went through it and looked at the workings and looked at the innards and figured out there was 11 keys that were pretty good to go and the rest of it was probably not going to work. So that, the whole foundation of the sound throughout extended stage is based on those 11 keys. So the old piano I wrote a ridiculously silly complicated algorithm to make every possible chord um, and random get random pauses between things so it makes quite ugly sound but because of the nostalgia of the instrument and we're on the scales we sit it's it's still evocative the space and it is amplified through an old railway PA system um, that I managed to get hold of so it all has this evocation of nostalgia so even that it sounds pretty terrible I think we all sort of feel this sort of, oh, this, it's sort of beautiful. Whereas the keyboards that go with the phenomenological displays that are mounted into china cabinets in this sort of gramophone-esque style, those again take those 11 notes across the receding scales, you know. They have a simpler algorithm, just makes the three chord notes that are possible within that, but then there's kind of a basis that, that the gaps between um, change as you come up the tunnel. Again, I think they're quite evocative with the phenomenological things occurring. It, it feels beautiful. Again, if you shut your eyes and you listen to them, they still evoke. I mean, I think they still evoke the, the, a sort of sense of beautiful music, but they're not quite there. And again, that's what's, interest, what's interesting to me is our desire for beautiful things. Uh, when we come to see art, we're set. We're going to see, we're going to have a certain sort of experience. And to me, the tunnel is a great opportunity because it's a very specific kind of experience and I, you know, I'm looking to generate experience in all my work that departs from the, the checkbox mode of art seeing where you know, I, I've gone to see famous artist A, B, C, D and I've read the curatorial statement and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I, you know, we, we could do it a lot more thinking for ourselves. So you know, the, in the works I make, I'm trying to generate curiosity, trying to create awareness of these moments of desire for things. Um, but I think desire can overwhelm logic sometimes. So, it's, it, you know, as I said, my music score can not be nice, but yet the desire for beauty, people will experience it because that's really what they want, you know, which is a good thing. <laughs> Providing moments of curiosity for people obviously ties into the the hacking, the repurposing. Yeah, that's right, the repurposing. So. I mean, Rousseau, Edmund Burke, countless philosophers all sort of said that curio the curiosity is the first of all passions. And then, um, you know, I guess they were forgetting about lust, but anyway, we'll move away from that. Um, but certainly, they were, but they were talking about looking at art. And they would say curiosity is the first, first of all passions, and it is the most important thing that an artwork should generate, is the, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but they bas both those guys at least basically said that. Um, and I kind of buy into that. I think curiosity is one of the most underrated things in society. There is a lot written by researchers like Barbara Marie Stafford and so on about this, the death of curiosity in our education system and how it needs to be brought back. So I, I in my own work, I've researched a lot about um, the old traveling, the Enlightenment era traveling science displays where they sort of wowed people with these events. That were, you know, look at the flea under the microscope, you know. You know, the likes of David Hume and someone would dismiss that as, um, you know, mere tricks, but it's not tricks, it's, it's curiosity. I mean, it's this desire that there's more than, more that we could know. And I think that's very important. And so that's one of the first things I think about when I'm making a work is 
in, and actually in a way I don't think I do think about it, I just think about what would be interesting to look at. And to me, I, curiosity makes is what makes it interesting. I think humour is important. I think it's through humour that we, you can make a lateral leap, you can realise something for yourself. You know, it, to me it's unpredictable, I don't know. You know, if you find something funny and you, you know, you're thinking about something else, you know, I mean, you might realise a more efficient system for making your breakfast, you know. Uh, in the moment of humour, who knows, but uh, it's a powerful thing. And um, repurposing objects, hacking things, I think there's empathy in it, and there's a strange, in today's, in new media technologies, there's a strange silliness. I mean, why the hell would I get this huge, you know, children's piano and hack into that just to access the sounds off that sound, chip, the, the sound chip that comes with that thing, when I could just go and, you know, get, get a little synth, yeah, I mean, the synths are so sophisticated now, as most people would know, you know, you can just tweak them, you can get the perfect waveform, you can make them sound like a shitty old ship's piano, it's easy. Uh, but I've got a shitty old ship's, a ship's piano because it's an object. Um, I've got children's keyboards because they're an object. Um, they carry other burdens and other significances, so, you know, even though it was a lot of work to figure out how to stuff a children's piano into a china cabinet, um, and come up with an amplification system that wasn't just putting a guitar amp on it to bring the sound out. There's actual, you know, speaker horns and, you know, gramophone style amplification systems being used. Yeah, the, the objects are important. I mean, you know, I even sort of used in those systems, for example, the, the sort of amplifiers that people buy for the, the stick on the rear deck of their Toyota in Western Sydney, you know, look at my car amp. Um, you know, so put that on display in the China cabinet made sense to me with the children's keyboard, with this, ampli with this more nostalgic amplification system. It sort of plays into the way I work, you know, uh, a, a bit of new media, a bit of cultural significance, a bit of empathy for understanding, repurposing things, and yet a weird kind of nostalgia, I think.